I can tell you some stories about Ed Haynes. <laughs> <coughs> Where shall we start? I am so taken with the story of his family and the trajectory that it reflects on life in North Carolina that I am incapable of describing. It is uh, a massive honor to be with you on this uh, delightful night, this beautiful place, these fancy digs, everybody all dressed up to the nines, looking like you're out on the town. You know, if I didn't know better, I think this could be a Republican gathering. <laughs> Except there's one problem. If this was a Republican gathering, it would be all white. <laughs> so uh, it would not be our cup of tea. It would not reflect the beautiful rainbow of this room. I. Uh, I'm glad to be among such stalwart Democrats. My favorite kind, deeply committed, in it for the long haul, inspiring, wise, hot-blooded, passionate, believing, undaunted Democrats. Those who understand that this party is meant to be a movement, not a social club a powerful force for hope and progress, not just a weaker, paler, softer, more confused version of our Republican adversaries. The kind of Democrats, to be candid, upon which all depends whether North Carolina will be a state with decency, with character, with generosity, with optimism, whether it will be, be again an actual democracy, whether we will ditch the aspiration of liberty and justice for all. I know you think I'm engaging in hyperbole, and I'll admit I'm capable of it on occasion. <laughs> but in what I just said, I am deadly serious. No hint of exaggeration. So it is an honor to be with you tonight, sisters and brothers, in arms. And I understand uh, that I'm required to say this, though it has become sort of obvious. I do not speak for the University of North Carolina. <laughs> I am barely allowed even to speak at the University of North Carolina. <laughs> I have discovered in the last year and a half, as have many, that love affairs can be one-sided, unrequited. The university I love apparently thinks I am a pain in its ass. <laughs> but for any of you who are Tar Heels, let me say that my affection for Carolina remains undiminished, undeterred. So much so that if I wasn't foolishly setting my own schedule, I wouldn't have been here tonight. I'd have been watching a basketball game. <laughs> but I'm here to talk about the defining crisis that we face in North Carolina. I aim to do that, but I want to mention just two things first. One is, I don't know about you, but I have started to think seriously about how much I am going to miss this remarkable president. almost unspeakably so, astonishingly articulate, stunningly honest, not a hint of lie or scandal in two full terms. Imagine a Republican being able to say that. A family that is almost unparalleled. I would vote for Michelle Obama in a New York minute. A seeker 
of peace, a seeker of justice, the most inspiring presidential orator since Lincoln, the strongest argument I've seen in my lifetime against term limits. And then there's this Republican freak show out to replace it. Children on the playground, but dangerous children. A hatred competition by these purported alpha males, inciting to violence, attacking Muslims, attacking Mexicans, attacking people with disabilities, attacking blacks, attacking lesbians and gay men, attacking women for their looks and their body parts, calling people pathetic losers and wimps, as well as some words that we won't mention this evening, saying that they're going to whip Hillary Clinton's ass, that they're going to carpet bomb entire nations, that they'll bring back waterboarding and even worse, and they wonder why a diverse world doesn't warm to them. These great, stout, macho men. Now, I don't believe in government by macho men. It is a terrible idea. But apparently they do. And given that, I just wanted to say that I grew up working on ranches and playing football in Texas. And I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But none of this crew would have been considered exactly manly men where I grew up. <laughs> Donald Trump, daddy's limo taking him across town to the private academy so he doesn't get his hair messed up. <laughs> Little Marco saying the same memorized words over and over again, a look of terror in his eyes. Ted Cruz. I said I grew up in Texas. You better believe that Ted Cruz was in the debate club. He damn sure didn't want to risk going outside. At least George W. Bush was a cheerleader. And uh, can I say, because this is important, these Republicans are now plying their central strategy that the only thing they know to do is to hate this black president by applying it to the United States Supreme Court. There can be no Obama replacement for Nino Scalia. The theory goes the most principled jurist in American history. Good God. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but Antonin Scalia was one of the three or four most activists least principal justices in our two centuries of constitutional history. He might have written like a theorist, but he always voted like a hack. He never let his constitutional theories get in the way of his politics. Never. And keep in mind, if you need any more incentive in this election, that we can now have Citizens United directly in our sights. But none of this is what I'm here to talk about tonight. I'm here to discuss what's at stake in North Carolina. This war for our own decency as a people. There is no use sugarcoating it. That won't make it less astounding or less all-encompassing. It won't help us to shade our eyes from the actual peril. There is no longer any basis for misconstruing it or underestimating it or speculating on what's coming. These folks are out to convert North Carolina into Alabama or Mississippi or worse and to do it as quickly as they can. And they are doing it. They are winning. The project is fully launched. It is underway. It is a rank betrayal of our history, our aspirations, our commitments, our constitutions, our religious tenets, and it is in brutal opposition to the prospects and possibilities of our children. What we've got to figure out is not what they're going to do, 
We know what they're going to do. The question is whether we're going to do anything to stop it. Are we going to fight it with every ounce of our being, proving who we are, who we demand to be? My old man was a big, rough-hewn fellow, unschooled, but smart and courageous and strong. It's hard to believe this, but when I was a teenager, every now and then I'd act out a little bit. <laughs> My old man would walk over, look me dead in the eye, and say, boy, there are some things we don't tolerate in this house. I won't go into it. Let me just say I knew that was serious business. That was the end of the foolishness. And that's what we've got to say to this brand of brigands. There are some things we will not tolerate in North Carolina. Not here, not now, not ever again. tolerate a war on people of color. We have come too far. We have spilled too much blood, too much pain, too much hideousness. When these Republicans go into those large caucuses in each house without a black person in the room, though North Carolina is a quarter African American, when they go in there and repeal the Racial Justice Act, and racially gerrymander these districts as this court has just ruled and impose ID requirements and make it harder for black folks to vote and crush these public schools and cut benefits and raise the taxes of low-income people. No black voice raises a vote or an objection. They govern as a white people's party, betraying North Carolina, betraying our tough but lesson learning history. They act as eager successors to Wallace and Faubus and Thurman, and they are not worthy of the high offices they occupy. And when they say, when they say to the women of North Carolina who seek an abortion, not only are we going to have the longest waiting period in the country, and not only are we going to make your medical care as expensive and as hard to secure as possible, but when you seek to exercise your constitutional rights, we're going to enlist your doctor, your body, your pocketbook in a coerced campaign to force you to comply with our religious beliefs. We will use the power of the state to demand that you undergo and pay for a sonogram without medical benefit, against your will, against your doctor's will. We will make him display it in your face despite your protest, despite his protest. We will force the doctor to mouth a Soviet-style legislative script even if he believes it's harmful to his patient, in an astonishing act of totalitarianism. Effectively telling us, like the Virginia legislature, you ought to consider yourselves lucky we didn't require something to be placed inside a woman's body in order to get her attention. All this by the same people who say it is too great an intrusion on personal liberty to be forced to have health insurance. I'm surprised the words don't turn to ashes in their mouths. But government by perjury has become the specialty in Raleigh, North Carolina. And last, though the list could be much longer, the United States' most aggressive and unforgivable war on poor people. 18% of North Carolinians live in poverty in this economically vibrant state of the richest nation on earth, the richest nation in human history. A quarter of our kids, 40% of our children of color, we have the fastest rising poverty rate in the United States. A decade ago, we were 26th 
a little better than average. Now we're 11th, speeding past the competition. We have the fastest rising rate of concentrated poverty in America. Greensboro, North Carolina is the hungriest city in the United States. Winston-Salem has had one of the largest challenges of child hunger, as you know. Charlotte has the worst income mobility in America. If you are born poor in Charlotte, North Carolina, you are more apt to stay that way than anywhere else in the country. So what do McCrory and Berger and their buddies do, given this, given that landscape? First, they kick 500,000 poor Tar Heels off of Medicaid, though the feds would pay almost the whole tag. And though it means literally that a thousand of us a year will die as a result of the decision. That's a heavy price to pay to show that you hate Obama. Then you usher in the largest cut to an unemployment compensation program in American history. We are stingier with working folks than any other state in the union. Then we abolish the earned income tax credit, raising the taxes of 930,000 Tar Heels, making about $35,000 a year. We expand sales taxes on poor folks. We kick 100,000 people off of food stamps and we cut the state's appropriation to food banks in half. A great response to having one of the largest hunger problems in the country. Then we abolish the appropriation to legal aid. And we do all this to cut dramatically the taxes of the wealthiest people, though they already claim a larger share of our income than has occurred in over a hundred years. Rendering North Carolina government an exercise in pure villainy. So we are in a fight. We could wish that it weren't so. We could wish that it was not as challenging as it is. That there weren't such powerful forces of wealth and privilege arrayed against us. That it wasn't such an uphill against the odds effort. But the apostles of American democracy have faced tough roads before. I am pretty sure that Fannie Lou Hamer didn't do an opinion poll mm -hmm. before she started the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And Mrs. Parks didn't conduct a focus group before she sat down for freedom. <laughs> Cesar Chavez didn't ask if it would be praised or lauded when he launched his famed hunger strike. He said instead, si, si se puede. This is not the first time that Democrats of courage and heart in this state, in this room, in this city have been called upon to fight for justice against the odds. And I know that some have grown cynical and given up hope and they don't believe we can win this daunting battle. But imagine saying that to Harry Truman or Frank Graham or Robert Kennedy or Julius Chambers or Ella Baker or Barbara Jordan or Paul Wellstone, or Molly Ivins, or think of saying it to John Lewis, cynicism has no more place in the Democratic Party than privilege does. So we ask you again tonight, even more powerfully, more dramatically than ever before, to enroll your spirits, to list your hearts, making this defining cause your own to enlist because somewhere we read, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal. And somewhere we read that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And somewhere we read that history will judge us on the extent to which we've used our gifts to lighten and enrich the lives of our fellows. And somewhere we read, of course, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And somewhere we read, think of this, we ought to believe the things that we teach our children, believe them and make them real. And somewhere we read that the arc of the moral universe is long, 
but it bends towards justice. And as I look around this room, I think most everybody read, whenever you did these things for the least of these, you did them for me. And that same group read, you reap what you sow. And somewhere we read that the pursuit of justice and the pursuit of happiness can be as one. They march not in opposite directions, but hand in hand. And somewhere we read, no, we are not satisfied with this. And we will not be satisfied till justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you very much.